He was asking us, what is the history behind the Irish saffron kilt? And you want me to do this one? As okay. our resident historian. I am not an expert on Irish history. Preface that. Caveat. Um, but, and there's a long answer to this and there's a short answer to this. The short answer is that the Gaelic revival of the late 19th century, which led to the Irish independence movement and things like the uh, Anglo-Irish War in the 1920s, all that kind of, all the history. One of the aspects that came out of it was certain movers and shakers in the movements wanting to differentiate themselves from anything English. Uh, the Gaelic Athletics Association was formed, for instance, to try and promote Irish sports instead of playing cricket or rugby or polo. They didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, and similarly, at the same time, they started thinking about, well, we should have a national dress. We should come up with something that is wholly Irish and is not uh, associated with the English oppressors, the overlords of the country. So there were a couple of different ideas on how to do that. Um, the most noted person whose name you might recognize involved in this was uh, Patrick Pierce, who was the founder of St. Enda's, the boys' school. He, at one point, thought that he had seen a museum display of some 17th or 18th century clothing uh, of an Irish make and an Irish cut, and it included trues, which are very close-fitting, uh, very tight-fitting pants. And he thought, wow, trues, trues in a jacket like this, like I saw in this museum. That'd be a great Irish national dress. That'll look great. And a friend, thankfully, talked him out of it before he actually went and had a set made for himself. For the, there was this big gala event he was going to attend, and he thought, this is what I'll wear to this thing. And uh, his friend said, no, you should probably do something that's going to look a little less cartoony. And in my opinion, said his friend, the, uh, the trues are not going to translate well to modern fashion, whereas maybe other things would work better. Hey, what about a kilt? And so he, and a, he was one of them, and uh, a few other people who I think predated him, Irish, Irish lords, actually, Irish, Irish, uh, Irish people who had been educated in England, like at Oxford and stuff, uh, who had become Irish nationalists, decided that they would take the Scottish kilt and wear that. And again, they were trying to do a throwback to ancient Irish dress originally and copy this thing called the lena, which is basically a large tunic, which reaches down to the knees and has very full sleeves. But the general consensus became that that was going to look cartoony and weird and, again, wouldn't really work so well for combining with modern fashion. You couldn't update it. It was always going to look kind of archaic and odd. And it being the Victorian age, a lot of them thought, well, why are you going to walk around in a dress there? You know, so they, th they thought it looked unmanly. So, again, it felt like the natural thing to do was to copy the Scottish kilt, which had been continually evolving and developing on its own over the past hundred years or so at that point. And so they thought, let's combine the, the best aspect that we can of the ancient Irish dress, which is the color. Lena were traditionally what we refer to now as saffron. Nobody's completely sure as to how brown versus how yellow it was, but they, they knew it was this kind of a mustardy color generally. Let's do that because it was the ancient color of the kings, quote, quote unquote. We can do a Kelly green, and we could also do a, a solid blue for St. Patrick, which was his original ecclesiastical uh, color. So those three colors became what was used, and the saffron kilts kind of took off on their own on a parallel path to the nationalists because some pipers started using it, and then sometime just before World War I and then going onward and upward through World War I and through World War II, Irish pipe bands attached to uh, Irish regiments of the British Army started using it as a standard uniform. So if you look at a classic military pipe band from an Irish regiment, and I can't remember the names of any off the top of my head right now, but if you look at them, if you look images of them, they'll be wearing a saffron kilt and a green doublet and this cape, a uh, cape thing, which I'm forgetting, the, I think it's called a bag or something like that. Um, that became a an invention of a uniform that could be updated but still harkened back to something ancient. Okay. So that's, the, uh, that's basically it. All Irish kilting goes back to the nationalists around the turn of the 19th century, uh, 19th to 20th century. And uh, it's evolved a lot since then. You have a lot more options now since the, the Ulster Tartan came out in the 1960s and then Tara came out around then too. And then the County Tartans and everything came out in the 90s, right? Yep, so mid-90s. It's, uh, it's kind of exploded in the past 20, 25, geez, 30 now years. But that's how the saffron kilts got started. 
they wanted to go in a different direction from Tartan, so they were being different from the Scots as well as from the English. It's always gotten mixed reviews. There were a lot of nationalists who thought it was a silly idea. There were also lots of people who thought it was a great idea. It's mostly, in Ireland itself, it's mostly been preserved as a pipe, piping tradition, not a civilian tradition like it is in Scotland. But uh, it's a classic option if you want to go with an Irish heritage look. Hopefully that's a good answer. If that didn't explain it well enough, I do recommend the article on this topic on scottishtartans.org. That's uh, Matt Newsom's website. And uh, he has a really good write-up, including quotes from various people I've mentioned. And uh, there's one quote from a kid who was actually at St. Edna's and Enda's, and uh, he hated it. Not all, the, <laughs> not all the students were into it. They really weren't. As far as they were concerned, it was a dumb-looking school uniform, and they wanted nothing to do with it. So it's school, you know. So. They're, start the, they're the ones starting the tradition. I can understand being pensive when, you know, hey, hey guys, yeah. get in this dress and, uh, you know, have right. your schoolmates and you know, all the other kids in your neighborhood hate you. That's that's what that's what yeah. the kid's talking about. Yeah, it's like the, yeah, he had to get used. <laughs> he had to get used to other kids in Dublin laughing at him for wearing this thing. So, but you know, you gotta start somewhere. Yep. So. Every tradition is a new tradition at some point. Right. Absolutely. <laughs>